Just thank you to the organizer for inviting me to present this talk and my favorite uh, subject, Cancer Biomarkers. So the first slide is uh, try to define the field of cancer biomarkers and you have a, a quite a good uh, article about that. <coughs> and clearly, the goal of cancer biomarkers field is to develop some simple, two important words, simple first, non-invasive test that indicate cancer risk, hello, early det cancer detection, try to classify tumors so that the patient can receive the most appropriate therapy. And also the goal of these cancer biomarkers is clearly to monitor the disease progression, <coughs> progression and fortunately regression of fully and recurrence. Anyway, <coughs> cancer biomarkers, oh, it's a new one. Yes. Okay. In my lab, we are particularly interested by cancer biomarkers which are proteins secreted in the bloodstream. Which can be this kind of protein? Let's say it's a beautiful painting of. Pride. Who is this painter? Pride. 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 Uh, uh, no, no, uh, no, 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 Anyway, unfortunately, maybe this nice lady may have a breast cancer. <laughs> if she has a breast cancer, the cancer cells may produce some proteins, and these proteins are in the bloodstream. So, with from a blood samples, you can get some blood samples, and in the super of the blood samples, in the bottom you have, you have the red cells and the white cells, and in the super you have you have the cancer markers. So these cancer biomarkers are clearly some protein produced by the cancer cells. Oh, that is. Yes. Oh, mm, yes, there are a problem. Anyway, believe me. First, slides about the capacity of various approach for the diagnosis and the monitoring of cancers. And you have to know that uh, personally, each of you have about 100,000 billions of cells. 100,000 billions of cells, each of you. It's 10 to the 14th number of cells. And a physician, for example, is only capable of touching a tumor of about one billion of cells. It's the size of a nut. In a nut, you have one billion of cells. So the limit of detection of a clinician is clearly a nut. It's one billion of cells. Imagine a very good radiologist it may be capable of detecting 10 million of cells, the size of a head pin, like that. Okay. Using tumor markers, the biologist is capable of detecting about 10,000 of cells. And the pathologist is capable of doing a diagnosis from only one cell. But clearly, tumor markers are quite interesting techniques because these tumor markers are capable of detecting about 10,000 of cells. Okay. The past and the present, the idea of cancer biomarkers is not really known because, uh, let's say, 80 years ago, you already have a technique reaction HM Zondek, not only for detecting pregnancy, 
but also for detecting testicular tumors. It's a test performed in urine of patients, not in the blood stream, in urine, but using this test, you can not only detect a pregnancy, but also a testicular tumors. So the idea of detecting cancer biomarkers is not really new. So it's for the past. Now, using some uh, virus assays, you are capable of detecting a tumor like this one. This one is has quite small tumors because it's 1.3 millimeters. It's a thoric carcinoma, it's a medullized thoric carcinoma. It's a quite rare type of uh, thyroid tumors. But anyway, some patients have this kind of tumors. And using uh, an assay for biomarkers, you can detect a tumor of 1.5 millimeters almost 20 years before the clinical evidence of the tumors. For example, this one has been detected in a young patient who was uh, 12 years old, and indeed this kind of tumors appears clinically around 35 years old. And <coughs> this kind of ACE, the tumor markers in this case is named calcitonin, and we have developed various ACEs including an essay for detecting medullary thyroid carcinoma using calcitonin as biomarkers. And uh, at the present time, this essay is capable of detecting the smallest cancer ever detected by blood tests, because this essay is also capable of detecting a tumor of 0.1 millimeters. We have developed in my lab and with my group uh, other kind of ACEs, and we have two lessons from uh, this slide. Because at the present time, about 100 million of patients have benefited from these ACEs. So, why this ACEs has been so successful? First, because they are simple and the measurement of these tumor markers using this assay has a tremendous impact on the management of these patients. For example, for the young patient who had a medullary thread carcinoma detected at the age of uh, 16 years old, he had surgery for his uh, cancer and he's cured. And the second lesson of this slide is that maybe sometimes, as you know, you are trying to develop a cancer biomarkers, and finally, you are, maybe you can develop cancer biomarkers, but also you can develop another kind of uh, utilization. That means this one, for example, we have developed an essay for procalcitonine, another tumor markers, another cancer biomarkers. This assay is used for the measurement of for the detection of cancer, but its main utilization it was totally unexpected. It's for uh, detecting some lower respiratory tract infection and for uh, determining whether or not you need some antibiotics. That's quite an important essay because lower respiratory tract infection is responsible for 10% of deaths all over the world and 75% of the use of antibiotics. And by using this assay, you can decline by 50% the utilization of antibiotics. Anyway, this one, this assay was also developed for the management of cancer patients, for the detection of cancer. But one utilization, clinical utilization of this assay is the screening of Down syndrome. It was totally unexpected. So, as you know, it's what is called serendipity. Serendipity is you are finding something by accident or sagacity why you are pursuing something else. We have also been searching for tumor markers, and sometimes we end up 
by finding something totally different than the Fortuna Matrix. That's good. Good. Anyway, during the last, let's say, 20 to 30 years, there are different kinds of proteins that have been used as tumor markers, cancer markers, for the management of cancer patients. Anyway, some other labs have tried another approach for finding some tumor markers. For example, using the omics for finding some novel tumor markers. Genomics here, proteomics, which have been the result of the utilization of genomics and proteomics for discovering some tumor markers. If you read this uh, paper published in Nature in uh, uh, 2011, if you read that, genomics, proteomics, and other technologies, other omics, promise to help by finding a combination of markers, but, but that promise has not been realized. Indeed, you have thousands of papers describing hundreds of thousands of novel tumor markers, but indeed only a teeny number of such tests have reached the clinic. This hundreds and thousands of novel markers didn't have a sufficient impact to be developed clinically. So it's quite disappointing because as uh, the title of uh, this paper said, cancer biomarkers easier said than done. Indeed, if you read this uh, journal, Genetic Engineering Biotechnology News, it's an interesting, interesting journal because we have a lot of information in these journals and it's free. So please read Genetic Engineering Biotechnology News and you will read that, for example, there are is no guiding theory for biomarkers discovery. No guiding theory of biomarker science. Uh, to do some research on biomarkers and cancer biomarkers, it's a high risk enterprise with 99% of failure. Just 1% of success. So, if you're interested by uh, this kind of business, it's not for uh, the, the chicken product. Okay. So, it's a difficult uh, domain which has the road of the future. When we are speaking about the futures, it's always quite hazardous. And if, if you read just out of the world, verses written by Shakespeare, what said Shakespeare? If you can look into the seeds of time and say which grain will grow and which will not, speak them to me. Who neither beg nor fear your favors nor your hate. Anyway, <laughs> these verses and these cartoons came from a wonderful paper published almost 20 years ago in Science. This paper, the title is How the Glass Lightly. It's a collection of scientists uh, at the frontier, like that, I read, a collection of scientists at the frontier were asked what they see in the future for science. It was 25 years ago. What does they say? Did they say 20 years ago? For example, this one, Michael Ashburner from the Department of Genetic, University of Cambridge. Novel sequencing method will increase the speed of DNA sequencing by a factor of at least 1,000. It's quite right. This one, by the end of the decade, all the genes contributing to genetically complex disease of human will be known. A little bit optimistic, but <laughs> interesting. Another one, the page, this one. Over the next few years, for every major cancer, breast, prostate, colon, breast, 
prostate, uh, colon, lung, ovarian, as well as many of rather form of neoplasm, a gene or genes will be identified whose presence increases the risk for the specific cancer of or cancer. Anyway, was quite right because at the present time, at least last month, you had this paper, and this paper explained that indeed more than 1,100 cancer predisposition genes has been discovered. Exactly the exact number is 114 genes, cancer predisposition genes, has been discovered. So the prediction was quite right. And if you look at the localization of the gene, for example, the genes for a predisposition of breast cancer, here is the 140 genes. So again, the view of the scientist 20 years ago was quite right. But maybe the most impressive uh, view was this one. Look at, at the end of this article, what does he say? Another guess is that within 10 years, the United States is likely to experience a terrorist nuclear explosion. explosion. When you read that, it's, uh, uh, September 11 was not a terrorist nuclear explosion, but it was a devastating uh, terrorist explosion. Anyway, today, predict what will happen in cancer by Marcus Field. It's always a little bit difficult, but we will, I will try some road and to define some road. And the first road of interest for developing some novel cancer biomarkers as a road constructed by experimental biologists. The experimental biologists, as you know, are working in what is called wet lab. <laughs> they are doing experiments with uh, sophisticated reagents, sophisticated machines, anyway. For example, this experimental biologist can work in the field of genomics, and uh, I am a firm believer that genomics will be an interesting source of novel biomarkers. Why? Because, as you know, we have some tremendous progress in the world genome sequencing. Only, let's say, 11 years ago, for doing a world sequence genome, you need 13 years, $2.7 billion, and uh, more than uh, 2,800 scientists. It was only, let's say, 11 years ago. Further sequencing <laughs> of the genome of Craig Venter, as you know, Craig Venter was uh, involved uh, by the world genome sequencing in the private sector. Okay. Anyway, for sequencing his own genomes, his four years, $100 million, and uh, let's say 31 scientists. Only six years ago, for sequencing the genome of James Watson, the father of DNA, it was about uh, four months, less than $1.5 million. And today, today, as you know, you have an explosion titled, you miss all the title of my slides. Uh, so the title of this one is The Sequencing Explosion. You have an explosion of the sequencing. And today, it was expected that the price of the world genome sequence is expected to be only $1,000. And the reality is, it's really $1,000. It's um, uh, an article in Bloomberg Business Week. And in Bloomberg Business Week, you have this paper. Would you pay uh, $1,000 to find out how you buy that? <laughs> but anyway, in this paper, 
said that the reality is that now Illumina, private company, has developed a test, and for $1,000, you can get the whole sequence of your genome. And in only, let's say, one day. And uh, in a few years, it's expected to be only $100. Okay? And you have several companies, for example, this one, complete genomics, or this one, bio nanometrics that will develop some tests for the whole genome <coughs> sequencing at $100. So, it's absolutely uh, an explosion. And from this cheap whole genome sequencing, now the you will find some mutated genes, and these mutated genes might become the next cancer biomarkers. Another road. Biomarkers emerging from epigenomics. Now, for those who are not really familiar with epigenomics, the best definition that I have found of epigenetics, epigenomics is this one. As you know, you have one, I said, uh, so 100,000 billion cells. And each of your cells have the same genetic information. So in addition to the genetic code, you need another code, epigenetic code, that will convert this genetic information, which is the same in each of your cells, into observable traits of phenotype. It's the genetic code. In this uh, paper from Nature, they said to correctly play the DNA, to correctly read the genetic information, you need another code, the epigenetic code. And as you know, the two main elements of the genetic code are first the DNA methylation and second the histone modification. As you know, during the last, uh, let's say, uh, 15 years, you have a tremendous interest for the epigenetics, for the epigenome, because, for example, it's considered that up to 70% of the contribution for a particular disease can be non-genetic. It can be epigenetic. <coughs> so, you have to be quite cautious because uh, you have such an excitement about epigenetics that now everything is considered as cause of epigenetics. Because you have hundreds, thousands of papers about epigenetics, including some paper published in the lay press, the, the, the front page of uh, time, while your DNA is at your destiny, your destiny is in epigenetics, not in genetics. And as said on this cartoon, if you ask us anything <coughs> you don't know, just say it's the due to epigenetics. Anyway, aside from gen expression profiling, I guess that some new markers will correspond to epigenetic alteration, and this epigenetic alteration will become some the future biomarkers, particularly in the cancer field. But there is a problem, because initially I've defined the field of cancer biomarkers as the development of simple and non-invasive tests. Do you agree with that? But at the present time, if you are looking at the genetic landscape <coughs> or the epigenetic landscape, you are looking at this landscape in cancer cells. That means that you are looking at some genetic alteration and you are looking at some epigenetic alteration in cancer cells. First, it's not 
very simple. And second, it's invasive because you have to get these cancer cells using, for example, some biopsies. So it's invasive. Our goal is to develop some non-invasive tests and simple. How can you do that? The solution might be that clearly it's known that in the blood stream you can find some free DNA that originate from, let's say, primary tumors to metastasis. So it would be possible to look at in this free DNA generated by metastasis primary tumor, you can look at some genetic alteration. You can also look at some epigenetic alteration in this free DNA that you can get only by taking some blood samples. So it would be possible to have some novel biomarkers present in the cloud uh, circulation. So I believe that the next cancer biomarkers will not only be secreted protein, but also some biomarkers corresponding to epigenetic alteration or genetic alteration detectable in the bloodstream. Now, aside from the broad constructed by experimental biologists, you can have some roads constructed by <laughs> the computational biologists. As you know, the computational biologists are working in dry lab. So what they are doing, it's not so simple, they are doing some data mining. And I do guess that by using computational biology, you will end up with some additional novel biomarkers. And as you know, it's this uh, approach which is followed by Google. Have you seen this uh, cover of time? The cover of time has Google software. And it is the ID of Line Page, one of the founders of Google, is to extract from the avalanche the huge amount of data that do exist somewhere in the world that to extract the right information for solve partly the problem of death, try to prolong to extend the human lifespan, but I also believe that by using this kind of approach, data mining, we can also discover some novel cancer biomarkers. So, we share the take home messages. First, in the 70s, in the 1971, Nixon launched the war against cancer. And 40 years after signing of the Cancer Act, which is uh, listened. The lesson is written by Vince De Vita. Vince De Vita is the former director of the NIH, of the experts in the field. And he said that so the best of the world on cancer is yet to come. The best of the, of the world on cancer is, yes, is yet to come. And my first message is the best of cancer <laughs> biomarkers is yet to come. Second message is. Uh, you have well understood that uh, the field of cancer biomarkers is a high risk enterprise with only 1% chance of success. So, if you like high risk, you can work in this field. As you know, science is not a quiet life. And uh, if you want to take, in, take risk to transform to do science, as said by Stephen Job, you have to think outside the box. So uh, I used to do some other talk about uh, the recipe for thinking outside the box. I will just give you today only one recipe for thinking outside the box. It's quite simple. You have to be at the interdiscipline between 
wet bench, dry bench, you have to be an interdisciplinary disciplinary scientist doing both experimental biology and computational biology. I guess that it's a very good recipe in the future for doing science and particularly for trying to search for uh, some cancer biomarkers. So, <coughs> by uh, following this simple advice, not so simple, because to do both an experimental biologist and a computational biologist is not so simple, but anyway, if you are doing that, you can be a leader in cancer biomarkers discovery. You can do that, believe me. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.